All right, here again is our logistic growth equation, which factors in the carrying capacity. This, this model leads to an S-shaped curve. The blue line represents our exponential growth model, which just has the growth rate and number of individuals. But now the logistic model, again, has the carrying capacity factored in, such that early on, you'll have a period of exponential growth. But then as you approach the carrying capacity, the growth rate begins to slow because n is getting closer to k, and this side of the equation is getting closer and closer to 0 until you finally reach the carrying capacity, at which point there is no change in numbers in a given unit of time. There is no growth. Um, now, this course is a theoretical uh, mathematical exp ex um, um, expression of the population growth. Um, sometimes populations adhere to this. As you can see, this one, this, this population of paramecium generally reaches its carrying capacity and levels off, but sometimes species can overshoot their carrying capacity, at which point resources will then become limiting and they'll come back down to that carrying capacity. Other times species can bounce around um, quite a bit, so there does not appear to be any kind of stability to the population or even perhaps a fixed carrying capacity. It's changing a lot, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, this model can also get us thinking about uh, different kinds of species, which I alluded to somewhat with the survivorship curves. And it's, it's thought that perhaps species fit into sort of some main groups, uh, what are called K-selected species and R-selected species. K-selected species are ones where density plays a significant role on limiting that population. Um, they're ones that tend to have uh, fewer offspring, um, more care of their offspring, slower population growth rates, whereas R-selected species have ones where um, the growth of the population is less dependent. It's, it's more density independent. Density does not play as much a role on the growth rate that, uh, of that population, and therefore they tend to have very high reproductive rates um, and lots of offspring, relatively little less care compared to, say, your typical K-selected species. Um, so, for example, if we just looked at mammals, uh, an elephant would be a classic K-selected species. Long life, few offspring, lots of parental care, slow growth rates, whereas a, a mouse would be more of an R-selected species where they have lots of offspring. Um, they do have care, but perhaps not as much per kid. Um, shorter lifespans, higher mortality. Um, all right. So um, populations can be regulated by various factors. Um, and so we can talk about density independent factors and density dependent factors. Um, and we can look at situations where um, birth rate is dependent on density, such that when you have a smaller population, you have higher birth rates. And also where death rates are density dependent, so you have smaller populations, you have lower death rates. Larger population, higher death rate, lower birth rate. And there usually be some equilibrium point some equilibrium population density that's a function of those two. Um, sometimes, so um, you might have a situation where death rate is relatively independent of population size, and so the death rate is relatively consistent no matter what the population size, but there the birth rate um, will perhaps be density dependent, and so then again the equilibrium point is where they cross, and here's vice versa where birth rates are pretty much the same no matter what density is, but the death rate depends on density. Again, you'll have this equilibrium population density. <clears throat> All right. So again, many factors can affect these birth and death rates, um, the resources in the environment, um, all sorts of things. So the amount of food as a population becomes larger, food can become a limiting resource. There's less food per individual. And therefore, there'll be a lot of competition, intraspecific competition within the species for those resources. Um, so here you can see, as the population of this bird species increases, the females tend to have small, fewer eggs, 
presumably because food is somewhat limited and she's not able to lay as many eggs as opposed to lower density population. Um, territoriality, many species are territorial and so they have sort of a fixed territory size and this can limit the population size. Um, nice picture of a cheetah marking its territory. Uh, these birds nesting, uh, these marine birds that nest on the shore have their little nest territory and that can limit the size of the population. Um, the overall health of the population, particularly with density, as density increases it makes it easier for pathogens to spread. If there's less food per individual that means they're not quite as healthy and they can be more prone to disease and other health problems. Um, predation um, can play a role. Think about it this way as a particular species becomes more common that means there's more of it for the predators to feed upon and so that increase in population size can basically make predation pressure increase because there's more of them to eat. Um, any individ one individual might have a lower probability of being preyed upon but the population as a whole because there's lots of them around the predators will tend to focus on them. Um, all right, um, let's see what else I want to talk about. So, again, all these different factors, these biotic factors like uh, competition um, and your food supply, these can all play a role in determining the population size, abiotic factors, um, the amount of water available, temperature amount of sunlight available, particularly with a plant, these can all limit the population size. <clears throat> and again, populations can jump around quite a bit, again, depending on the surrounding conditions. Um, all right. So, um, immigration can play a role as we've talked about. And when we talk about a metapopulation, we're talking about sort of populations within a larger population. And so you can have situations where perhaps one of those subpopulations has high birth rates and those individuals immigrate out and add to the surrounding populations and in essence maybe even subsidize those surrounding populations. <coughs> um, all right, we've already talked about that. Now, this is an interesting, the, we talked about this boom and bust cycle before, but here's a nice case study of it, the snowshoe hare and the Canada lynx. And so these exhibit a nice example of boom and bust. Each one is going up and down, up and down, up and down, and they appear to be strongly, closely linked to each other. If you notice, it's not a perfect match, but it is a pretty good match, and it appears as if the snowshoe hare population increases first, then the Canada lynx, and of course, my way might the Canada lynx be going up? Well, the snowshoe hare is their primary source of food, so if there's lots of snowshoe hares, there's going to be lots of food for the Canada lynx. Well, if there's lots of Canada lynx, then they are going to eat all the snowshoe hares, and their population will come down and then there's a fewer hairs and so then the, the lynx comes down and vice versa and you can see this nice cycle just up and down and up and down. Now, uh, the very end of this chapter talks about the human population. Um, the human population has been growing quite a bit, particularly recently. We've exhibited strong exponential growth recently. Um, can it just grow on indefinitely? Well, ecology would tell us, no, that there would be some limit to the size of the human population. Um, and so you can see, basically, with um, particularly with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, the human population has just really taken off and exhibited nice exponential growth. Um, now, the rate of growth has begun to slow. This is the annual percent increase in the human population. You might look at these numbers and say 1% growth, 2% growth, it doesn't seem like very much, but over time that can lead to some significant growth. Um, so 
these data end at 2003. We're at 2014 now, somewhere around here. And I don't know what the number is right now. I believe it's still above one, but it is slowly declining. Um, and there would be some folks that would say it'd be ideal to reach zero population growth. Um, that probably would be a good thing in terms of, again, the resources on the planet and a growing population. There's only so many resources out there, and if the population keeps growing, then there's fewer resources per person. That can create conflict between populations and countries and such. Um, now, way back in the day, back here, we had very low growth, essentially zero growth, you might say. But that was a period, whoops, the wrong way. That was a period in human history when there were relatively high birth rates, but also high death rates. Um, this is the age before antibiotics and modern medicine, so mortality rates were much higher. More ideally, we would reach now a period of zero population growth with low birth rates and low death rates as well. Um, when death rates are lower, particularly amongst kids, there's no need to have as many kids as, say, back in the day. Um, this phenomenon known as the demographic transition that we'll talk about here in a sec shows this nicely. And so you can see in these different countries, um, again, birth rates and death rates have both been coming down over time. Um, and that's what you see with the demographic transition. So here you are in the pre-industrial phase of a country, and you've got high birth rates, high death rates, um, and they're sort of equaling out. The population is growing at some points and shrinking at some points, not changing a whole lot. But then countries go through a transition as they begin to modernize, industrialize. Death rates come down because of access to more food and improvements of health care. Birth rates tend to stay high for a period of time because of social inertia. The families are just used to having lots of kids because that's the way we do things. But then as you modernize even more, birth rates come down because now you've sort of transitioned to a much more modern, industrial, even technological society. And Fertility rates drop. Women have fewer kids. More women are working outside the home. Um, they don't want to have as many kids. They're not homemakers anymore, if you will. They have their own careers and professions, and so. And plus, again, now that death rates are down, there's no, con there's little concern about your kids surviving, or not nearly as much. And so, there's no need to have as many. And you reach that very late industrial, post-industrial phase where birth and death rates are both low, and relative equilibrium with each other. And there are many industrialized countries that have reached this point, and some that have even gotten to the point where birth rates are lower um, than death rates, like Japan, Italy, um, uh, some other European countries are actually, their populations are shrinking somewhat. All right, now age structure is another way of looking at a population. You can talk about these age pyramids, and in your edition of the book, this is on page 1189, and so it shows the different cohorts and the percent of the population that is in each cohort. So you can see in Afghanistan, they have a classic pyramid shape. There's lots of kids, but there's a fairly rapid decline as people get older. Um, that is, there's relatively few people in the population that are of these much older ages. Whereas if you look at the United States or Italy, you see a more even distribution and with Italy, in the case, you actually see a contraction at the bottom. And that's an indication that this pop part of the population, these, these reproductive age people in Italy, are not fully replacing themselves. They're having relatively few kids. On average, a woman is going to have to have a, two kids to replace herself and her partner. But in Italy, you might have fertility rates of only on average of 1.5 or something like that. In the United States, you can see a slight contraction. Here we have the baby boomers, um, and so they're the kids that were born after World War II. They themselves tended to not have as many kids as their parents, so you had a slight contraction, but a bit more equal distribution. Um, in the United States, we're maintaining our, Italy is actually shrinking in population size. The United States is maintaining its population size largely due to 
immigration because we have a significant number of immigrants in this country.